in 1937, a book was published that would forever impact the philosophy of success, money, and personal development. This book was the fruit of 20 years of research and over 500 in-depth interviews with millionaires at the time. The book was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Since its publication, Think and Grow Rich has sold over 100 million copies worldwide. It has found its way into the libraries of the most successful men and women in all spheres and industries. John Maxwell has listed Think and Grow Rich in his lifetime must-read book list. There are countless useful and amazing principles taught in the book. This week, we conclude our two-part series of Napoleon Hill's list of 30 major causes of failure. Are you ready? Let's dig deeper. Welcome to the Thriving on Purpose podcast, hosted by certified coaches Elizabeth and Sebastian Richard. Elizabeth is a Christian life and leadership coach, branding consultant, and busy mompreneur. Sebastian is a Christian speaker, Bible teacher, author, and leadership expert. Together, they help today's committed believers to dig deeper in their knowledge and walk with God in order for them to grow and climb higher in life and leadership. If you want to dig even deeper, make sure to visit thrivingonpurpose.com for more free resources and content. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Thriving on Purpose podcast. Be sure to go back if you haven't listened to the 30 major causes of failure part one. You'll want to go through that content. It was a very good podcast. And today we are continuing part two and considering subscribing to our podcast wherever you're listening in from. If you want great content on leadership, personal growth and faith, uh, that's what we're all about at Thriving on Purpose. So let's dig in, Sebastian. Okay, so we did, like Elizabeth said, we did 1 to 15 last week. Now we're at point 16 of the 30 major causes of failure, which is over-caution. Over-caution. In order to get far in life, you have to take risks. You'll only get so far by playing it safe. Risks are often necessary and they don't always work out. But eventually, they do. Those who are too cautious and afraid to venture into the unknown will often fail. So obviously, taking risks is a big part of success. Any successful individual will tell you when they tell you their story, it's going to be sprinkled with risk all over. Why? Because you can't get to anywhere in life if you don't take risks. I mean, even when I wanted to marry Elizabeth, I took a risk because I put, like, when you fall in love, you take a risk, right? You're taking a chance. You're opening up. You're, you're making yourself vulnerable. That's taking risks. But there's other kinds of risk, obviously, when you're building a business, you're, you're using your own capital to invest in your business. That's a risk. Some people are willing to invest more than others. They're, they're willing to take greater risks. And oftentimes they reap greater rewards. I found that the greater the risk oftentimes is associated with a greater reward. Exactly. And it's all about, you know, going outside of your com comfort zone. If you're able to do that with your money, with your investments, with your plan that you're, that you're oftentimes entrepreneurs and, and business people and people that you know, get these ideas from God are oftentimes starting something that doesn't exist. It's a new idea and that could be, you know, kind of risky or scary sometimes to get out of your comfort zone in that way. But those that are um, risk takers oftentimes will reap a great reward out of that. Amen. Number 17, 
wrong selection of associates in business, or we can say even business partners. There you go. So who you choose to do business with can often be another huge cause of failure. Choosing someone who lacks the right qualities can often end up in them making the wrong decisions and ruining all your hard work in business. Yeah, and the Apostle Paul also warns us to not be unequally yoked. Obviously, that applies to marriage, but as a believer, it can also apply to any business venture and the people you will associate yourself with. If you're a believer who wants to bring the kingdom of God in your business, make sure that your partners are also believers who have the same goal. Exactly. Because oftentimes people that don't have the same values, the same character, will oftentimes uh, end up ruining a lot of your hard work and just won't see the vision and the values that you're trying to put into your business. Amen to that. Number 18, superstition and prejudice. I'm going to tell you a little story about myself. Uh, about 10 years ago, I, I used to perceive certain types of preachers, especially the highly successful ones, those who made a lot of money, as wolves in sheep's clothing. That was my mindset at the time. I wouldn't listen to these guys, even if I had a gun put on my temple. I, I, at the time, I was against preachers making money. I thought they were just dishonest that they were working for Satan, and that's where I was. I'm not kidding you. But as a result, my mindset stayed at a certain level, which was really not profitable for me. I needed to grow past my prejudice for these people because, see, what happened is I had heard from other preachers that these guys were bad. I didn't even listen to them for myself and forge my own opinion about them. I had just heard a preacher that I happened to like at the time talk ill about these people. So I didn't listen to them. I didn't take the time to hear what they had to say and make my own opinion about them. So as a result, like I said, I didn't really grow farther from that mindset where I was at. Years later, when I was growing and developing myself and I finally decided to give quote unquote these guys a chance. I began listening to them and I, I felt very foolish because looking back, I was like, wow, for 10 years, I didn't listen to these guys and I could have grown more than I, than I was if I had, but I was prejudiced. And because of that, I was missing out on fantastic teachings about faith and spiritual growth and even personal growth uh, in certain cases. So never believe what someone's going to tell you about someone else. Make up your own mind about the person. That's the lesson I heard, I learned from that experience. And ever since then, I don't listen to what so-and-so says about so-and-so. I make my own idea. I, 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 I figure it out for myself. Sometimes, the results are quite positive and agreeable and wonderful. And I'm like, wow, am I glad I didn't listen to so-and-so when he was criticizing that person because I learned a lot from that person. Other times, it just so happens that they might be right. And I'll be like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I don't really agree with what they're saying. And, and this is not helpful to me spiritually or on a personal growth level. So you have to make up your own mind and not be prejudiced. And when we talk about superstition, um, we oftentimes hear the comments, you know, people, Christians will say sometimes, oh, you know, nothing good happens to me. I'm not lucky. Um, you know, it's like for some reason, you know, God doesn't want to bless me or, you I'm know. I'm cursed. The, yeah, Some I'm people think that. Or, you know, there, there's a lot of negative talk in that way that people sometimes believe that the higher power around them uh, just doesn't want them to succeed. So, you know, that's obviously negative talk. That's not from God. God does want you to succeed. So you have to, you know, shake those thoughts and not have this, not have the opposite either of I'm lucky and I'm going to get this because I'm so lucky. And, you know, <laughs> there's, you know, there's no such thing as luck. God chooses and God gives and blesses. And, uh, you know, we, we all have our part to do in this. Exactly. Amen to that. Number 19, Liz. 
wrong selection of a vocation. So many people make the common error picking the wrong line of work. So unless it's something you can't go a day without thinking about, then you shouldn't be doing it. Most people, 95% of people hate waking up on Mondays because they have to travel and do jobs they don't like. And they do all of this just to get a paycheck. So everybody's in it for the money. And I think this is so sad, you know, with the millennials today that are just following the, the, you know, the sheep. They're all like sheeple following to go in a certain vocation. And they don't want to, you know, they're not... They're not called to do any of that. They just don't know what else to do. They can't find themselves. And they're just like going to program to end up failing, getting out of that program, trying another program. It's like they're searching for themselves this whole time when honestly they should save their money, take some time off and figure out who they are, find their purpose and really just then decide what they're going to study. They're, so they're just going through the motions because oftentimes their parents are like, you have to study, you have to study, you have to become somebody, you have yeah. to have a degree, you have to have a diploma, otherwise you're going to starve, you're not going to have money. And you know they're all listening to all these thoughts and they're completely lost and oftentimes end up not even doing anything close to what they study. Okay, but there, there's that. But there's also, like those are for the young people, but there's, there's also the case of people who never actually chose right. a wrong vocation. They never even chose anything. They just like... Found the job, hate the job, pays well, does it, and don't question it because, hey, doing something you hate, that's life. That's what my father taught me and that's what my grandfather taught me. So I know it's just part of life. So they don't even question it. That's even worse than choosing the wrong vocation. At least those who choose a wrong vocation are actually trying to make a choice. But those who don't even make a choice, who just like endure just for the sake of enduring, that, that's even sadder. And there's a lot of people stuck in that kind of rut. They don't even realize that they're here for a reason and they're supposed to contribute something to humanity that only they can give. And that's a crying shame, really it is. Uh, and some other, there's other cases also of people who climb the ladder of success. They, they devote themselves to something that they, they think they want to do. They become very good at it. They climb the ladder of success only to realize that that ladder was on the wrong wall the whole time. So in other words, they've been climbing the wrong wall because they're not doing what they were supposed to do. They were, even though they were successful, they did something that they weren't called or expected to do by God, which is another shame. Number 20, lack of concentration of effort. So do you know how long the human attention span is? It's not that long as we know, which means concentration on something for a long period of time is ridiculously hard. And it's even harder if you're trying to concentrate on something you don't like. Absolutely. So this is, this all goes back to, you know, you're going to have a lot more concentration um, and it's going to be a lot more motivating for you to persist in learning something if you know that it's leading towards that goal that's going to give you your dream or that purpose that you know you have to accomplish. Even if you know you have to study a certain thing that's going to help you to do that, it won't be as hard for you to have that concentrated effort. And and think, uh, don't forget, Think and Grow Rich was written in 1937. Napoleon Hill called it lack of concentration of effort. Today, we have a very short word that means that and it's called focus and like elizabeth said focus is only uh is the bedfellow if you will of something you love it's very hard to stay focused on something you dislike doing right you can do it for a little bit but to do it for a long time you need to do something you love number 21 the habit of indiscriminate spending do you often buy things you don't really need How much money has that new TV made you recently? Zero dollars. That's odd, really? No, it's not. Jim Rohn said that poor people have big TVs. Rich people have big libraries. So if you spend on stuff you don't really need, on stuff that's not going to serve you, you're spending your money in the wrong things. You need to be spending on things that will serve you. Okay, wasting money instead of investing it in yourself is what separates, like I said, the rich from the poor. So think about that next time you want to buy a whole new wardrobe. 
right? For example. Yeah, and you know, I think that there's people that have an unrealistic um, expectation of where they're spent of their money. Um, you know, people get into you know, entrepreneurship into building businesses and they seem to think that they're going to spend and do things exactly the, like the way they used to yeah. and have a business. And and in reality, when you're starting out, you have to focus your money on where it matters. Exactly. That means, for example, you will tough that TV until it actually busts. You won't like be replacing as much new stuff in your house and you're going to be wiser in how you decide to spend because you're always thinking of the bigger picture of where you want to go and how much money that's going to cost for you to get there. I know so some, your priorities change. Yeah, and I know some entrepreneurs who have been trying to grow their business for the last two, three years that maybe in total put $2,000 on their business. But they might have put $5,000 on their backyard or on souping up their car. I mean, seriously, is that stuff you really need? Use your money where it's going to bring the most value to you. Think long term. Think, think long term, absolutely. Exactly. So, you know, that's, I, I like the way you worded it, indiscriminate spending. See, Napoleon Hill doesn't, isn't against spending. He's against spending in the, on the wrong stuff. And that's indiscriminate spending. Number 22, lack of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is a key to achieving success with anything you do. Without enthusiasm or a real passion for your work, you will be unable to go the distance. This is the same reason for why people who chase money will never find it. When money is a driving force instead of passion, you will give up on the activity long before you become successful at it. Absolutely. Passion for something means you want to do it every single day, regardless how, of how much money you're earning or the number of setbacks you're experiencing. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Lack of enthusiasm is a, is a huge deal breaker for success. And lack of enthusiasm is also linked to having a positive mindset, which we talked about in last week's episode, how important it is to be positive. Well, enthusiasm and positivity go hand in hand. It's very hard to be enthusiastic if you're a negative person. So be positive and be enthusiastic, especially when it's something that a fresh idea that you're working on. And, and when you get those fresh ideas, that's when your enthusiasm is at its highest. So now's the time to work them. Don't wait uh, a day, two days, a week, two weeks, the enthusiasm is going to wane and you're going to, you're going to kind of lose that momentum that you, what you had initially. And you know what? I think that that's very important. You know, when we talk about doing what you're passionate about, there's a lot of people that are in a business that they're not passionate about at all. They're not passionate about the products. They're not passionate about building leaders and they're, it, and it shows all they want is the end result. Cause they're like, okay, well this extra money is going to really help my family. That's why I'm doing it. But people feel that and we, and most people quit because the passion isn't there. The passion to build the business, the business isn't there. The process of doing it, of accomplishing uh, that business and, and loving the products and the process and building those people is not there. So no matter how you want to spin it, the person's heart isn't in it, it they're not going to tough the run. I like that. How, how, no matter how you spin it, if the person's heart isn't in it, it <laughs> rhymes. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Number 23, intolerance. Being open-minded is something every good businessman or entrepreneur should be. Open to new ideas, new way of thinking, new types of people, new ways of doing things, even if you've been doing it for, a, for 25 years a certain way, if you're taught a new way, at least be open to exploring it. Intolerance of others and their ideas is also going to hurt your reputation, especially when the people you're intolerant of are people you work with or do business with. Obviously, being open-minded, being a tolerant person is a huge key in your leadership, in your people skills, and in your EQ, and in your overall success. Because success is going to be very hard to reach if you don't have extra hands that are willing to help you. And guess what? When you're open-minded, 
you're being open to other people. And when you're open to other people, they want to help you more. Intolerant people are not fun to work with. You know, I mean, if you if you pitch an idea to someone and they just keep rejecting everything you bring them, you're not going to want to help them anymore. So if you have people on your team, always keep an open door policy idea wise, mindset wise. OK, not just of your office, but of what they're going to propose and say and bring to the table. Yeah, I think this is a very huge point. You know, um, I've heard this many, many times in leadership and there's a lot of people that have strong personalities, strong leaders that tend to want to to create other strong leaders that are exactly like them. Mm -hmm. And so they just want to have this, you know, group of four or five women or, you know, men to do this. They want to have people that are very similar to them and do the same hobbies and do the same things. But the problem with that is that, you know, every different personality can offer different strengths in the company. And I've seen this in t team building as well. You know, a lot of people will try to change a certain person that's a little more introverted. And, you know, sometimes that person, the, if they dig a little deeper to getting to know them, has really great management skills and can help you create systems to help, you know, your new people on board and they have all these great ideas but they're not like you. So in a way, it's a good thing because they're going to bring some different things to your team that you would have never even thought of that will help build. So I think it's really important to accept that nobody is going to be exactly like you, that they all have their own personalities and their own traits, but they, they also have their own qualities and also their own strengths to offer to your team. So mm -hmm. you have to dig and find what those things are. Amen to that. Number 24, intemperance, intemperance. In the word intemperance, we have the word temper. You need to keep your temper in check. I mean, most entrepreneurs, business people, uh, Christian movers and shakers who have ministry ideas and want to bring things to the next level, these people are driven. And usually, people who are driven have a strong character and usually people with strong character might have difficulty controlling their temper. So you have to make sure you keep your temper in check. I mean, anger and snapping at people does not have its place in functional teams, in functional projects, in functional anything really. It's all right to lose your nerves once in, a, once in a while. We all do. We all have bad days. I mean, it, it, and you just need to recognize it and, and ask your, the person or your team forgiveness for that when it happens. It's understandable. Uh, you can be under a lot of stress. It does happen. But intemperance is similar to intolerance in many ways. It, it's just another major cause of failure. If you're someone who has a tendency to get angry, you're going to end up annoying a heck of a lot of people. And that is never, ever good on your road to accomplishment. Exactly. You have to try to keep your cool. And if you do have a problem with certain things that have happened in your team that get you angry, you know, go blow off, blow off some steam in private. Try to come back when you're more composed and, you know, try to deal with the situation calmly because if you're going to let out your anger and blow off steam to people, um, you're going to be setting yourself back and your team is going to take a lot of steps back. And it's going to be hard to recreate that momentum again and get everybody back going into a speed that's, you know, positive and energized again. And I'm going to have a little word, a short word for introverts here. Passive aggressive behavior is no better. Passive aggressive behavior will have the same detrimental effect on your team and on the people you work with as if you were to snap outright to their face. It can actually, in some cases, be even worse. So passive aggressive behavior is also part of intemperance and you don't want that. Yeah, and exactly, because it does root bitterness in your heart. Yeah. And then you're not moving in the same direction towards the same vision goals. And it's actually pulling you back. And it's going to hinder you and it's not going to make you move towards success because you're just focused on whatever is making you angry and bitter. Yeah, exactly. So your focus isn't where it's supposed to go. So you won't get anything um, positive and you won't get success out of what you're trying to accomplish. Number 25, inability to cooperate 
with others. Collaboration with others is inevitable. You're going to have to do some teamwork. After all, every business is the business of people. If you're unable to cooperate with other people, then you won't get very far at all. We said that already. So the only way to get what you want is to help other people to get what they want. That's what Zig Ziglar used to say, and he's absolutely right. And that won't happen for anybody who refuses to cooperate with others. So you have to develop that team player spirit. No matter what role you're playing on the team, whether you're the leader, whether you're just a, uh, um, someone who's playing you know, a, a lesser role on the team project, learn to play well with others. That's going to serve you in so many ways. You know, I, I think this is a, a very important part in leadership, you know. There are leaders that always, always have to decide everything and take the, the floor and be the center of attention. And they're, when it's time for them to be team players, they have a very hard time. And it's important to be able to know how to do both, to be able to take the reins when it's time to take the reins and to also, when you're part of a team, to let others shine and to cooperate with others and work well with others. It's really a skill that a, a true great leader has to master. Amen to that. And number 26, possession of power not acquired through self-effort. So which means people who have been given power and not earned it themselves are destined to fail. They are destined to fail because in most cases they will not have adopted and mastered the essential habits and skills required to earn this power in the first place. So we see that in the example, you know, when um, someone inherits a big amount of money through the lottery, for example, uh, there's been studies that have been made that oftentimes just the year after, 12 months later, they have basically lost all their money yeah. and uh, spent it and just, you know, were very unwise in the way they used their money, didn't invest it. And very, I think, you know, a lot of them have this idea that a million dollars can go so very far when in reality, we know that, you know, if you, if you waste it, it can go by, it, it can, can, it can fly through your fingers very quickly. Exactly. So it's important to, you know, learn the skills and the habits, you know, like they say, the proverb says, teach a man how to fish instead of giving him the fish yeah. something like that yeah. what is the, the well if the you word? if you give a man a fish you feed him for a day if you teach him how to fish you feed him for the rest of his life exactly so it comes back to that right so it's really important to learn these skills and to get the knowledge and to to go through uh, those years of of transformation of of growth because you know once you go through that even if at the time you're doing it, it kind of feels like difficult and, and hard, always stay, keep in your mind the thought that I'm learning and no one can take this away from me. The, this acquired knowledge will always stay with me. Yeah. And, you know, that's priceless. And then when you get to the goal, you're going to be so happy that you did. And you'll look back and say, wow, what, how I've grown, you know, through this process, that's priceless. Nobody can take that away from you. And that's why millionaires are able to make other millions easily because they know how mm -hmm. they know the recipe so if they lose a million it's not the end of the world because they're able to regain that and more and i and i think there's a word of caution here for trust fund babies and maybe not many of you are i guess lucky or unlucky enough to be a trust fund baby depends on how you look at it but trust fund babies usually are born to excessively successful families they inherit the family fortune by default, but they didn't earn it. They didn't get this, develop the skills to, to have the mindset that, that goes with acquiring that fortune. So it's basically something that's handed to them. And in my book, Lead Like a Superhero, I have a chapter that talks just about that because I think it's so very important if you're going to be in a leadership position that is handed to you. If your father has a big business and he's giving you the reins because he's retiring, you have to make sure that you make yourself ready for this. It, you can't just trust the, uh, well, it's given to me and it's going to be all okay. No, no, no. You have to make sure that, hey, this is coming in, I don't know, in five years, I know I'm going to inherit the business. I have five years to get ready for this. I have to take the right courses, have the right mentors, ask the right questions, prepare adequately to when the time comes, be an adequate leader to 
keep this thing going in the right direction. And a lot of trust fund babies don't do that. They fail to do that and they become failures in the process. Their character is a failure, their image is a failure, and they're basically a joke and everybody knows the punchline but themselves. So you don't want to be like that. And that's why I used Aquaman as, a, uh, as an example. Those of you who've seen the movie Aquaman, you, you, you saw that the struggle of what he was going through when he knew he was going to inherit the kingdom of Atlantis, the pressure, he kept saying, well, I'm not a leader. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I can't do that. But at least he knew that there was a huge step there for him to make, to get ready, to be worthy of that mantle. And a lot of people don't take this seriously. If they're trust fund babies, they, they just don't see the necessity to develop themselves. So and, I, and even I would say in churches, I, we've seen that too in big uh, churches where the the sun takes over, um, you, you know, people have ex, you know expectancies or expecting you know the yeah. the yeah whoever it is junior to fill in the shoes of, of the father and obviously it's not always possible because they're a whole different person but still you have to work that experience and that knowledge by you know acquiring that 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 knowledge and studying and trying to be the best that you can be and not assuming that it's going to be okay to just step in and just go with the flow of things because you do have big shoes to fill. Amen to that. Number 27, intentional dishonesty. And I know we're talking to believers. I know we're talking to Christians and Christians are never dishonest. We're always full of integrity and wonderful. Not... <laughs> Here's the thing, okay? If we're honest, here's the thing. If we allow little dishonesties in our life at the stage we're at, let's say we're starting out and we're allowing little dishonesties, little, a little bit here, a little bit there. Well, guess what? When the stakes grow and the income grows and the business grows, these small dishonesties are going to become bigger, you're going to allow bigger ones later on because the pressure is going to mount. Uh, the deadlines are going to be closer. Uh, it's going to be uh, quick, quick, quick. So as you're pressured into doing those decisions faster, you might, if you began crooked, the curve will just accentuate with time and you're going to let bigger dishonesties creep in your life and your business and it's only going to get worse. Make sure you start off on the right foot with a covenant with yourself that in your business, you're going to be honest no matter what. Even if, the, for example, you have a deadline for the 20th of the month and you know you're not going to reach that deadline and you know that if you call the client and you tell them it's going to take five more days, you might lose the contract, do it anyway. Call the client, say, look, I know I told you I would be ready on the 20th. Your, the, the thing you requested would be ready on the 20th. I'm sorry, I won't be able to deliver. I'll do my best to give it to you on the 25th. Is that okay with you, yes or no? Instead of just saying, yeah, yeah, it's going to be on the 20th and, and, and then not giving sign of life to the person on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and then on the 25th coming over like nothing happened and just pretending like everything's okay and just handing over the project with the person in front of you with a sour face looking at you like, what are you trying to pull? I, I think I made myself clear. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, integrity in your business is so crucial as a, a believer. If you want God to bless your business, it's really important to deliver quality work uh, and in, in, uh, in you know, with integrity and uh, always remembering that you're doing it for God and for the people you're serving. Yeah, and don't kid yourself, huh? We think sometimes with intentional dishonesties, little uh, little things here and there, we think that we're getting away with it, but we're not. It's going to come back to bite you in the you-know-what very, very soon if you don't deal with it. So halt this. If you have that, if, if you've done it in the past and, and you've noticed it in your life, halt it right now. Bring it before the Lord and ask God, hey, I need to change this. Help me, empower me. Help me to make amends and help me to start afresh with an honest procedure in my dealings with others. And that brings us to number 28, egotism and vanity. 
So ego often gets in the way of people improving their knowledge and education. Mm -hmm. It also gets in the way of collaboration. So I've come across many people who are either too stubborn to understand why they're wrong or collaborate with other people because they think they're bigger than everyone else. Yeah, yeah. you can't let ego get in the way. I mean, we know what brought Lucifer down was ego. I'm going to be like this. I'm going to be like the most high. I'm going to be like... And we know what the rest of the story is, right? Ego, uh, pride, the Bible says, goes before the fall. So... Yeah, and I, I would also add that um, it's really... I've seen that many times, you know, ego when it comes to do with knowledge. Yes. You know, people that are very, very smart will study a lot and will think that they're better than everybody else and that they have nothing to learn yeah. from evaluated experience because they've done more master's degrees and this and that and that, or that they read more books. So even if they're very knowledgeable, I mean, I don't think you can stop and say that, you know, you're... <laughs> I think it's wrong to, to have such a big ego that you can't even say that you can learn from everybody that puts that God puts on your path, right? Yeah. I think we have to, to not have a big ego and in that way and always think that we can learn from, you know, different... Sometimes it's learning from the failures of others. Sometimes it's learning from, you know, what not to do, but we always learn and I think we should always be open to that and um, collaborate with others in our business too that uh, can think bigger, that have things to offer us, not always thinking that we're the best person in our business and everybody else is under us. That's a really wrong way of thinking. And it's kind of funny because in my dealings with others, I've realized that the really, really big dogs, those are very, very successful. They don't have much of an ego problem. Uh, a big dog knows he's a big dog. He doesn't need to bark. <laughs> he doesn't need to try to prove that he's a big dog. He knows he's a big dog. He's not worried about anything what people think. But the small dogs, the up-and-coming dogs, the, the, um, those who are trying to uh, dog-eat-dog world, <laughs> try to bite the others off and, ah, no, it's my turf, my turf, go away. These are the ones with the most of the time who have big ego problems. And years and years ago, I, I, I had to face myself. I had developed an ego problem. And Liz was the one who pointed it out to me. And uh, I, I didn't divorce her. I didn't. I, st <laughs> I stayed with her. <laughs> it actually served me quite a bit uh, because basically she was being used by God at the time to show me that, you know what, I had become arrogant. I had become uh, someone with a large, a big ego. And that was due not because of a lot of knowledge. In my case, at the time, it was because of a little knowledge and they say that a little knowledge is a very dangerous thing because here's what happens when you accumulate a little knowledge you're such a rookie that you think you actually have a lot of knowledge so you fall for that ego trap and most people you'll meet who have big egos because of their knowledge it's usually because they have a little knowledge and those who have big knowledge they don't trumpet it they don't make you feel like you're nothing and in, in, in fact it's it's kind of strange because these are probably the nicest people you'll ever meet. The big dogs are the nicest people you ever meet. And they're the ones who can teach you a ton, who, who could actually uh, maybe have that inflated ego because they do know so much, and yet they don't. Number 29, guessing instead of thinking. <laughs> so if you're guilty of this, you're just asking for failure. So a lot of people I've known through the years guess and they don't really know the the real answer. They just pretend to. And so they kind of, you know, start arguments and um, they have this mindset where they know it all and they assume and they don't actually do the research. And, you know, it's funny because when you have conversations, it's not very hard to see how far they know by asking the right questions. Yeah. So there's no point in pretending you know about a certain thing. Just say, what is that? I, I haven't heard of that, you know, enlighten me or explain this to me. Like, you're better off to be, you know, in a, in a position of, I want to learn from you than pretending that, that oh my it. gosh, like I'm not smart if I don't pretend I know about this. Exactly. And it, and it's hard to fall for that trap, right? Because nobody likes to feel like they're the ignorant one in the group or whatnot. But at the same time, 
that's how you learn. You get to ask the question and say, you know what, guys? I'm not sure about what you're talking about. Could you enlighten me? It, it, nobody's going to put you down for asking a question like that. I mean, or, yeah, or I've heard about this, but I don't know much about it. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. I've heard that expression before. I've heard about that before. Could, could you tell me more? I, I, I didn't research it. Exactly. And also, Google's your best friend. In today's technological world, if you're going to prefer guessing instead of thinking, I mean, it does. It doesn't take long to Google something if you don't know about it. And it's oftentimes a five minutes that's going to save you a lot of trouble down the line if you just forego it and say, oh, I'll just, it must mean that, or it must be this, or, and then you make a major mistake instead of having taken the two minutes it takes to Google it. And yeah, there's no excuse properly. today with all the technology that we have. I mean, there's so many videos on YouTube that you can learn so many different things. Uh, I mean, the web is full of knowledge. You can take a mini course on a certain thing if yeah. you need to learn something, you know, quite fast. I mean, it, you know, knowledge at, is at the is at your fingertips today. It so really there's is. no excuse for kind of, you know, just saying, oh, I'm just going to guess this one or kind of go with the motions. And then I don't really need to learn this and whatnot because... It is important. So those that are, don't have success oftentimes are just guessing, kind of winging it yeah. and don't really have the information, haven't really learned what they're supposed to learn. And they're not willing to learn it either. And they're not doing the research. And the other thing, you know, going back to what we mentioned, I mean, I know somebody that always in a conversation uh, would act like they knew what we were talking about. And um, that person didn't know, didn't have a clue. And I could tell just by the kind of questions and how she was answering very vaguely. And I was thinking to myself, why would someone do that? So the person obviously, um, you know, has an inferior inferiority complex. She's scared of showing that she doesn't know. But in reality, when you have this attitude, you don't learn anything. No, you don't. So you just go through life through the motions of not learning and it doesn't make you grow. And it just keeps you stuck in that same level. So why not, you know, why not be open to learning from other people around you that have studied more, that have read more books so that you too can grow? I mean, it's just a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So stop looking at yourself like you're ignorant and you have to pretend to be, you know, smart. You can't pretend to be smart. Exactly. You have to be or not be smart. <laughs> be or, to be or not to be. <laughs> but but uh, also there's the expression that says, if you're the smartest person in the class, you're in the wrong class. In other words, it's always good to be surrounded by people who know more than you, who can add value to you with their knowledge and experience. And another thing I want to say here is very important. The book is not titled Guess and Grow Rich. It's titled Think and Grow Rich. And the think part is very, very important. If you don't think, you're not going to grow rich, okay? <laughs> very, very important. Number 30, lack of capital. So that's our last point. That's our last point. Lack of capital is 30th on the list of major causes of failure. Money is obviously an issue for many people who have dreams and ideas, in most cases, to build the business they desire. Often, if their business plan is good enough, they'll be able to seek investors or be able to start smaller with lower costs. Yeah, and, and this is also very important to think when we have lower capital, when we're starting out, oftentimes we don't have uh, tons of money to start it for a startup, right? Or, or whatever we're trying to build. It's time to think. It's time to be smart with your money. I'll give you a quick example. When you don't know what you're doing with Facebook ads, it's going to cost you a fortune. When you do know what you're doing with Facebook ads, it's going to cost you peanuts, so before you invest in Facebook ads, if you have a limited amount of money, it's really a good idea to figure out how to do it properly so that you end up doing an ad that's actually going to bring you money instead of an ad that's only going to cost you money. And then you're going to be like, Facebook ads don't work. That was crap. So lack of capital. Yes, it's more limiting. Yes, it's going to demand of you when you have lack of capital. It's going to demand you fr from you more effort and more time. So you're going to have to pay in another form. So you, you can't pay it in money. Well, then you have to give more time to studying something to do it a, a cost effective way uh, or put more time uh, in doing it 
doing the doing the longer way, the scenic route, whatever, uh, which is gonna possibly in the end y- yield very good results, but it's just longer. You have to be more patient. And you know, I think that it's uh, a really good thing, a really good quote that I heard Paul Martinelli said. He said, you know, successful people don't say to themselves, I can't do a certain thing. Successful people say, how can I do that thing? There you go. And when and, you have no funds, and, that's the main question you need to ask yourself. Okay, so I can't, I don't have the $15,000 for a so-and-so. Uh, what I do have is $2,000. How can I? with $2,000 accomplish what I want to do? Or how can I raise the remaining $13,000 to accomplish what I do? Yeah, another book you might want to read is Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, and he says that as well. And uh, actually, I think I, he's the first one I heard say that. Um, you know, when when he's talking about his rich dad and how his rich dad would think, and it's really that's that's the limiting one of the i think the worst limiting beliefs is that people don't even want to start even if they have a great idea because they're like well i don't have the money yeah and in reality when you look at most of these successful people how they started they didn't have a penny like a lot of them were sleeping on mattresses on the floor things were going really really bad and they're, they shifted their minds and they worked so hard on their mindset that they started seeing how they could yeah. accomplish a certain thing. And some of them, you know, did two, three jobs. Some of them found other d- different ways, creative ways. But I think the worst word you can say is I can't yeah. to stop you from getting any success. And, you know, oftentimes when you have lack of funds, sure, it, it does set you back somewhat. But, you know, in reality... It's not the lack of resources that prevents us from being successful. It's a lack of resourcefulness. The most successful people, you'll see, they're extremely resourceful, persistent. They have, they have that grit, what, what we call grit today, right? That quality of, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to find a way around this. I'm going to overcome this. They have that desire that is so strong that that it, it just burns through everything they, they, they touch because it's, it, it's, they're on fire, right? And I think that's very important to realize that your passion will make you overcome much of all these, uh, these 30 uh, causes of failure. Your passion will bring you through most of them. And, and by the way, we're, we reached the end. Uh, we reached the end of the uh, second episode and we covered all 30 major causes of failure. But since it's the second episode uh, and you, you, you might have forgotten or you might have joined us and not listened to episode number one, we're just going to recap the 30 major causes of failure. Number one, unfavorable hereditary background. So you're born stupid, let's say. Number two, Lack of a well-defined purpose in life. That's huge. Number three, lack of ambition to aim above mediocrity. Number four, which by the way, number four can be overcome easily, insufficient education. In today's world with Udemy, with university, easy access to schooling, this can be overcome. Number five, lack of of self-discipline. Number six, ill health. Number seven, unfavorable environmental influences during childhood. Number eight, procrastination. Number nine, lack of persistence. Number 10, negative personality. Number 11, lack of controlled sexual urge. Number 12, uncontrolled desire for something for nothing. Number 13, lack of a well-defined power of decision. Number 14, one or more of the six basic fears. In other words, fear. Number 15, wrong selection of a mate in marriage. Number 16, overcaution. Not, no willingness to take risks. Number 17, wrong selection of business partners or associates in business. Number 18, superstition and prejudice. 
Number 19, wrong selection of a vocation. Number 20, lack of concentration of effort, or what we like to call today, focus. Number 21, the habit of indiscriminate spending. In other words, spending your money where it won't matter. Number 22, lack of enthusiasm. Number 23, intolerance. Number 24, intemperance. Number 25, inability to cooperate with others, not being a team player. Number 26, possession of power not acquired through self-effort. Number 27, intentional dishonesty. Number 28, egotism and vanity. Number 29, guessing instead of thinking. And number 30, lack of capital. Now, here's a question for you as we end this series on the 30 major causes of failure. How many major causes of failure have you been guilty of? Now, that's a question that fits all of us because we have all been guilty, I would say, of at least one, but there's probably a lot more in most cases. Like, I found myself in a lot more than just one in the list. And I've been honest and transparent during the podcast, and so has Liz. So, how many major causes of failure have you been guilty of? That's a very good exercise to do. Look at yourself in the mirror. Ask God to help you overcome these either habits or problems or hurdles so that you may have the success, so you may become the person that you need to be to have that success that you're seeking. Exactly. And, you know, all of these things are very workable, you know, maybe not the first one, but the other ones are. And so um, you can look at that pain point, that that struggle point and say, you know what, I know I can do this better. And that would help me to refocus or to to realign myself to, to have a better result. So I think that's a really great exercise to do. And, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to come come over to our Facebook page, Thriving Purpose, or you can even comment on the bottom of this podcast if you go to thrivingonpurpose.com and uh, listen to the podcast there on the bottom. You can comment, and we'd love to hear uh, what you've, you know, what has uh, really um, impacted you, what points you really had a red light on and were able to, to see and work for yourself. And, and there's a small prayer, you can, a very short prayer you can make every day that's going to help you overcome this. I found it's helped me a lot in my life. Just ask the Lord every day, Lord, help me to live to my fullest potential today one day at a time to live to your fullest potential. And you know, when you pray that, right away when you ask God for this, He's going to pop some things in your mind that you need to do. Yeah. Because when you ask God, help me to live in my fullest potential, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit will show you stuff that needs to get done today that you can actually do today in order to live to that fullest potential on that very day. Exactly. So we hope you enjoyed this podcast. Don't forget to sign up to uh, our emails. We send out one every week with the latest podcasts at thrivingonpurpose.com. So have a great week. Be blessed. And thrive on. For more free resources and content, make sure to visit thrivingonpurpose.com 